joined again by Dr. George Boy Stones. George, welcome. Thank you for joining us once again. Thank you for having me back. It's great to be here. The last time we talked, we really went through the development of Stoic, allegorical, and exegetical means as a way of retrieving ancient wisdom. In this segment, I wanted to talk about how the middle and later Neoplatonists took these methods and applied them, not only to ancient wisdom, but also to reinforce the primacy of Plato himself. You point out in your book, Post-Hellenistic Philosophy, that the Platonists added a single premise that made all the difference in the world, that the ancient wisdom had been reconstructed in its entirety by Plato. Tell us a little bit about how Stoic exegesis was absorbed by Platonic thought. As I was saying last time, we talked about how the Stoics developed the thought that you can reconstruct the wisdom of the earliest people, which has a certain privileged status through fragments of, of the, the Greek mythological tradition, but then other mythological traditions too, by sort of process and comparative mythology. I wanted to apply that to, in my mind, the mystery of how it is that just around that period, you suddenly get people who are talking about Plato as being a figure of, of tremendous authority in philosophy. Someone whose thought is to be not, not just engaged with, he's always been taken seriously, but someone who you can sort of assume has got it right. And I, I want to see whether we could put those two things together. And my thought was, well, what if it's the case that they think that Plato has, that the Plato's special place in the history of philosophy kind of comes from the fact that he already knew that this was the case, that you could reconstruct this privileged philosophy from the study of ancient wisdom traditions. Right? And that, in fact, what his philosophy is, is an expression of, of a program of reconstruction that he successfully achieved. And I was sort of encouraged in that thought by the fact that you get a lot of biographies of Plato uh, at this time that have him travel around all over the place to, to meet the sages of, of traditions around the world. So not just Greece, not just Egypt. People have been saying he's been from, you know, from his own day, people are talking about him going to Egypt, but also to India and to Persia and all over the place. So why are they saying that? Well, maybe they're saying that because they want to explain how it is that, that he comes to occupy this position of authority for them, that he's successfully reconstructed the ancient wisdom. So Platonists take, they, I think that's a theory that they have, and they take, they take on those methods themselves. So you get examples of, of Platonists engaging in uh, the exegesis of mythology this way themselves. Um, so, for example, talks about the myth of Ithopisis and Osiris at some length, and then Zoroaster, he's very keen on other things too. And I take it that they're doing that then to sort of try and prove the point that if you can show that, that, that this Platonic wisdom is there within these ancient myths from other traditions, that sort of proves that that's where Plato got it from in the first place, which shores up the idea that he, he has some sort of special authority. That, that, that was my thinking about move from the Stoic um, scenario to, to the establishment of this whole new movement, really, which is Platonism of this period. It's very interesting that in this early first century period onward, Plato, in a sense, gets, for lack of a better term, canonized even, right? Yeah. Like, Thrasyllus is canonizing Plato for the first yeah. time. Yeah. And then you have these groups kind of yeah. springing up, maybe having less to do with Plato's immediate successors who are very skeptic, strangely right. enough, about everything. Right. I know you touched upon a few of them, but I didn't know if you could go through some of the thinkers who are pioneering this way of looking at the, the myths and lore yes. at this time. One of the problems that we have with, with Platonism is that we don't know who the pioneers were. So, so Thrasyllus, you, you've given uh, a very good early example of someone who clearly is thinking about Plato in this way, but we know about him because he, he establishes, he arranges the dialogues in, in, in the, the order that we, we use today, in fact, still. So a great sort of reverence for the canon, I think you're right, trying to establish the logistics, the non logistics and put them in an order and so on and so on. In terms of people who are thinking about the the use of allegory, we can only really talk about, we can't be talk about who pioneers this, but we can talk about conspicuous examples. And they would be people like Plutarch, who is one of the, the most surviving Platonists of the period, if I can that sort of way of putting that. He's got a whole work on the myth of Isis and Osiris, how one might interpret it, which goes through a series of interpretations, but then shows in the end how the Platonist interpretation is the best, the one that, that explains most about it. And so it does that sort of job. I think I'm right in saying, by the way, that that's the earliest full account of an Egyptian myth that we have. So it's a, it's a 
important work. But he's also very keen on, as I say, on Zoroaster. He likes um, the dualism of, of Zoroastrianism. He, he has things to say, not in surviving works. We've got some very intriguing fragments about some um, Greek ritual traditions, which talk about, explicitly talk about the first people, the autochthonous first people and their views about God and how they're preserved through these traditions. So he's clearly taken that, that sort of way of thinking from the Stoic figures we talked about before, like Colossus and Karen and so on. Someone else who weaponizes this really interestingly is a, is a guy called Celsus. We don't know anything about him except that he wrote a big, long attack, a very well-informed, very early attack on Christianity, which in the third century, the Christian origin gives a, an even bigger, longer reply to, thanks to which we know uh, what Celsus was saying. But one of the things that Celsus is a little bit obsessed with, actually, is the fact that the Christians and the Jews, but even more so than the Christians, just fall outside the kind of range of ancient authoritative wisdom traditions. And that's one of the problems with them, that they spurn the Greek tradition and the Egyptian tradition and their own, but their own is, is really a sort of corrupt version of this. So that whole way of thinking about getting back to ancient wisdom becomes a, a, a polemical weapon uh, in the hands of Kelsen. So he's very, he's very uh, keen on that. And then there are some fragments here and there. Numenius, who self-describes as a Pythagorean, but really thinks what any Platonist thinks, is quite interested in, in the exegesis traditions. So there's a the very funny fragment relating to him where he's supposed to have had a dream one day where the, the goddesses appear to him naked. And, and he says, this is... Um, not decent, what are you doing? And they said, well, this is what you've done to us. You, you've gone and through explaining what those sort of mysteries of the Eleusinian rites are and, and, and all these allegorical accounts of a divinity in, in the tradition, and you've stripped us naked. This is what you've done to us. So he clearly, we don't have a lot of it, but he clearly was very interested in, in, in getting back to the primitive truth through, through an understanding of the traditions too. So there's a lot of it about. I think in, in method it's quite iterative. I mean, it, it's really, really interesting to read, but it's sort of doing what the Stoics already set, set us up to do, as it were. Platonism just seems to be this very malleable force that is very permeable to new ideas and taking those in. And in a sense, it's it's kind of like early Christianity in, in that regard. It's very interesting you were mentioning uh, just now about it was not only Plato, but like you also see these figures like Orpheus and Pythagoras as well. People are constantly appealing to these figures who were further and further back in time for authority. I was talking to a scholar named Dylan Burns who has this book mm. about Sethian Gnosticism mm. and uh, the Sethian Gnostics at Porphyry's um, lectures and, and his book two of the Enneads against the Gnostics and how these Sethians were using this very polemical weapon, like you were saying, of appealing to this ancient wisdom, but they were doing it in the exact opposite of how a proper Platonist would do it with saying Plato is the benchmark for this. Like for them, Plato wasn't the benchmark. It was p figures like Zostriano, Zoroaster, all these all these pre-flood figures. Very, very interesting. It shows you that it can be used to prop up status quo or be a countercultural kind of current. That's what I wanted to talk about just for a moment. Just these when they're reconstructing this primordial wisdom, like I said, they're appealing not only to how Plato did it, but they're also appealing to figures like Orpheus and Pythagoras. So I didn't know if you could just talk a little bit more about this. This is something else which really struck me when I was thinking about this originally, which is that I think traditionally people have thought, well, somehow or other Platonists just have this kind of, so quasi-religious attachment to Plato, and that's why they take him to be authoritative. But one of the really interesting things about their attitude towards Plato's authority is that they, although they take it to be absolute, or at least they treat it as if it is absolute, it is not exclusive. So they're very happy to say that Pythagoras has equal authority with Plato. And indeed, there are Pythagoras, as I, I just mentioned, Numenius, who, I mean, all of his work is, is referencing Plato, is exegesis of Plato, is, is, I mean, he's indistinguishable from a Platonist. But he clearly thinks of himself as a Pythagorean, and everyone else calls him a Pythagorean too. So, in a way, you know what you call yourself. It's not about the individual figure, uh, and Plato is not the only person who's done this. And, and, and you know, why would he be? The clearly they think is a, is a sort of cultural movement where people recognise the value of of mythologies and, and Plato. The thing about Plato is that he is the one guy who wrote all this stuff out pretty clearly. 
So however hard you find to interpret the Platonic Tachinox, at least we have them, right? So Plato is, is the best access we have to that generation or that, those, that sort of era of, of, of um, mythological of people who are thinking with the mythologies. I think that's how it works. Plato isn't exclusively authoritative, but he's, he's uniquely clear in the way he, he transmits this wisdom. But absolutely, Pythagoras, everyone would agree, is on the same page. Uh, and the list really expands. So I mentioned Celsus earlier. He at one point gives a big list of people that he thinks counts as authoritative and all sorts of people. There. So Orpheus, who as far as kind of modern historians are concerned, is, is pretty much a mythological figure, but he there is a, 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 um, a corpus of hymns that are ascribed to him and they come from a Pythagorean Platonist milieu. And so there's a sort of neo-Orphism around this period too. So they look back to Orpheus. Other early poets as well, uh, Linus Musaeus, and of course, you know, the, the big figures in, in other traditions like Zoroaster, as you, as you say. I, in a way, one of the most interesting things here is that Homer comes back into the picture. So, so far we've had Homer as a conduit for earlier thought, but now, now we've got this idea that there's a, this sort of these generations of earlier Greeks who themselves were reconstructing ancient thought, there are people who think that Homer is one of them. So after all, now, for the first time, actually, we get people who think that Homer is systematically readable as deliberate philosophy, because Homer, like Plato, has reconstructed the ancient philosophy. Only Homer has himself decided to pass it on allegorically as well. Now, this is the period where you, you start to get people who write whole works on Homer as if Homer's an authoritative figure. Too. But they're all saying the same thing. I mean, that, that's not a contradiction because you know, more than one person can be right at once. And in fact, for Platonists, the sort of glory of the era that are this obviously idealizing in a hopelessly extreme way, but, but they, they sort of think of the era as one where really people didn't disagree very much because they were very anchored in this, in this ancient tradition. But as I say, Platonism lead the charge just because Plato, I, I'm going to say Plato says what he thinks. I mean, the one of the frustrations people have with Plato is he doesn't really because he puts all in the mouth of Socrates and you have these dialogues and all that's very complicated, but it's a hell of a lot clearer than anything we have from anyone else is the point. So we can do something with Plato. The whole thing I find ironic about it, if you're reading something like the Phaedrus, what Plato ultimately says, you know, you can't, if you write something down, that's not how you would obtain knowledge. His first generation of successors are all skeptics, skeptical of knowing anything at all, right? Plato himself is writing with these dramatic voices, almost polyphonic voice, right? It's interesting that people would see him as writing down the ultimate wisdom. But you're right, the dialogues are just by very fact, like we were saying earlier, that you have a canon, you know, Plato has that primacy. And it also ties in too, right, to what Dylan called the the Platonic underworld. You have all these other things going into it too. You were just mentioning the Orphic revival with the Orphic hymns. Chaldean oracles, while maybe not as important to somebody like Plotinus, it becomes extremely important to later Neoplatonic thinkers like Iamblichus and people after him. It's one of the reasons that the people start to talk about why people have done philosophy in, in allegory in the first place. It talks of this a lot, actually, which is that it's it somehow, you're starting to address issues which can't be said in normal language. I mean, very difficult concepts, concepts which you need to grasp intuitively and be led to rather than, than, than have explained to you. And I think that's why poetry has a role in this and allegory has a role in this and, and that oracular form has a role in this. And so your, your observation about Plato is really helpful there. The, the, it's not like Plato, in fact, is able to say all of this super clearly, but it's just more clear than it. He's found this kind of clever way of both telling you and sort of making you think about it at the same time. So he's some sort of clearer than anyone else, but no one can say it really clearly. So you get all these different ways of experimenting with trying to lead the reader towards it. I make a lot of music analogies. Music is like my second love. Like when people think of goth, they think of a band like The Cure because The Cure has this massive catalog of stuff. But really it was created by these bands that are maybe around for three or four years like Bauhaus, maybe leave three or four records out there. You know, people are creating a canon. They're looking back on maybe a romanticized, idealized time that didn't necessarily exist. I feel this next question is kind of important for def definition of terms. So I didn't know if you could tell us what the argument from disagreement is. You've mentioned that Plato's successors went skeptical, which is right. So what happens between Plato and, and the period we're talking about now, first, second century, 18, let's say, 
is you get a, a, a kind of explosion of debate after Plato, after Aristotle. Again, this is a slightly idealizing history because actually, if you if you you know do this plot and go back, there are a lot of schools and debates going on in the in the fourth century and the third century in the context of Plato and the context of Aristotle. There's a lot going on, but most of it doesn't survive. Most of these schools kind of fizzle out. So from a from a later perspective, you can kind of round up a bit and say basically you've got Plato, you've got Aristotle, and then you have in the Hellenistic period this kind of explosion of major schools that have real traction and uh, um, uh, and subscribership, and, and they have, they're the major debates. So you've got Stoicism, Epicureanism, and you've got Aristotelianism in the mix somewhere. All these new theories. But what Plato's school does at that point is the academy is still surviving as a school, the school that Plato founded. But what they do is they, they sort of step back at this point and say, well, hold on a minute, we've got all these people who have very, very different views about the world. And, you know, we could do Plato and have yet another view. But actually, what's our criterion now how do we how do we judge between these different views and so plato's school becomes quite interested in those sort of epistemological issues about how you can choose how you can, how you can know anything essentially and and they push the line that you can't and there are lots of ways in which they do that it's a very interesting topic in its own right but one of the you know sort of simple foundational arguments that that skeptics have is the very fact that people who have views disagree with other people who have views, that no one can agree on anything, and there doesn't seem to be a way of deciding between. And this debate is intractable. So, you know, you've got three centuries of, of Stoics banging heads with Epicureans and they don't get anywhere. So um, what even if you yourself sort of think, well, Stoicism kind of seems right to me, you've got to take into account the fact that there are as many people who think exactly the same about Epicureanism. So that Leads you to sort of question your own intuitions, maybe. So the argument from disagreement is essentially a, a, an argument that challenges any dogmatist to, to give a reason why we should believe them rather than all of their opponents. And so long as people are disagreeing, there's probably a reason to disagree. We probably shouldn't choose. And, and my thought is that, well, I, I think you can sort of see this in in movements towards the what, what we now think of as the end of the Hellenistic period, the sort of first century. BC, you can see that a sort of stalemate has started to um, settle in at this point. So none of the old debates getting resolved. There are, there are new moves tried, but you know nothing's really going anywhere. And it, I think it's sort of one of the philosophical challenges of the day is to find a new way forward. How do you answer the, the, the uh, argument from disagreement? And you see different people try different things. So there's a, a, someone who's attracted a lot of interest in recent decades called Antiochus of Ascalon, who was maybe the last head of Plato's Academy. In fact, he, he sort of steps back from this and says, well, you know, we've been going on about how much debate there is between everyone, but is there really that much debate? Is there really that much debate about the, the essential things? So he tries a move where he says that, that the amount of debate has been exaggerated by the skeptics, and he comes up with a philosophical system that, that shows how a lot of these people really agree much more than they say they're agreeing. So that's one way I, I think you can see people really grappling with that challenge. But the reason I think it's relevant to the Platonist question is because I think that Another part of the story of, of why you get Platonism in the sense of a movement that takes Plato as an authority figure is that that I see them as trying to make their own innovative move against that argument. That if you could establish somehow that, that any particular figure has authority, if you could find some sort of non-philosophical argument for that, then of course you'd have a reason to, at least provisionally, align yourself with them. So the suggestion I made is that one of the motivating factors for Platonism is, well, two thoughts really. One is, if you can't identify anyone who has some sort of a priori reason, you have some a priori reason for believing, then let's be skeptics, right? But then the second thing is there are actually, re there may be reasons ahead of time, as it were, to think that Plato has some special status in all of this. And the reason is to do with what I was just characterizing as that slightly idealizing view of the history of philosophy, where everyone was agreeing before the Hellenistic period started. And I think the, the thought they have is that you can sort of trace the history of disagreement back to Plato. Plato is a kind of point of departure 
and that you can you can do a sort of historical etiology of disagreement in terms of the way in which people sort of go in opposite directions away from Plato and then they start arguing with each other. But that gives you some hope that maybe Plato was right in the first place. Because if you disagree with him, you never find a position that other people are happy with. So you go from this historical position where, not true, but let's say everyone, everyone sort of agrees with Plato, to a historical position where everyone who disagrees with Plato disagree with each other as well. So no one disagrees with Plato and doesn't also disagree with other people who are disagreeing with Plato. So that's a, it's a slightly weird argument, but it's at least a way of saying Here's a reason to take Plato serious. And then you add that to sort of historical hypothesis that I was talking about before, that Plato has traveled widely, thought widely, engaged with these ancient traditions. And that gives you an explanation for how it might have been, historically speaking, that Plato would have have had a, a system that was so robust. So we've got an explanation for how Plato comes to have a good system. We've got an explanation for why things go to pot after Plato. And all of this, I think, presents a reason for taking Plato very seriously. And either you just admit that the skeptics are right and give up, or you take Plato very seriously. And that's my view of what Platonism ultimately kind of is. And then the more you study Plato, the more you realize that you were were right, of course. I mean, the, the results have to justify that, but it's a good working hypothesis. That's where I think Platonism is coming from. My final two questions are going to harken back to actually my very first episode on ancient barbarian wisdom. And we did touch upon this um, a bit already with figures like Orpheus, Pythagoras, things like that. I didn't know if you could kind of talk a little bit about what ancient barbarian wisdom is for those who are perhaps unfamiliar with the concept. The emphasis on the barbarian isn't so important in my view of things, but the, 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 um, the ancient is. So the thought is that for various reasons, you think that a lot of the problems that we have, a lot of the arguments that we have, a lot of the misunderstandings we have come from centuries of, of prejudice, also of technological intervention in our lives. So we, we have become very used to messing with nature, building our own environments, and so on and so on. And so we that removes us from a, a kind of natural relationship with the world and, and is is that sort of technological intervention is part of, of our own mental corruption in a certain way. The thought is that if you could know what it was like to be a thinking human being before all of that stuff, when when humans lived in a more natural relationship with nature, you'd have a really interesting insight into ethics, but also physics, the way the world works, the way parts of the world work together in, in a sort of harmony that's not always visible to us now. So people become very interested in thinking about what the very earliest human beings thought. And of course, there's a premise here that there are such things as the earliest human beings, um, but, but, but that's what most people do believe, um, that human beings are created or emerge from the earth at a certain point. Um, so it'd be really interesting to know what they thought. And the idea is that the one hope we might have of hearing their voices is by looking at the kernel of the, the mythological and religious traditions that, that we've inherited through originally an oral tradition, of course. And the, the so-called barbarian wisdom becomes interesting here because one of the checks on whether you're finding genuine voices of antiquity within your own traditions is whether you're hearing those same voices, the same kind of perspectives in the traditions of other barbarian, i.e. non-Greek traditions too. And and you go and look at what the Egyptians are saying and what the Celts are saying and what the Persians are saying and what the Indians are saying and so on and so on. Everywhere you can, what the Jews are saying too. At some point, people are very interested in that. And then you see where they converge. And uh, that's the thought, that you can you can use that as a method of disinterring sort of ancient wisdom as a check on, on your own philosophical thinking. You were talking earlier about how these concepts can be often weaponized at this point in time, and they certainly get weaponized in a couple of figures that I'm going to talk about later. So we see these methods used in Philo, where we're just talking about it, Moses as this figure from antiquity. He was a very wise to... You mean to say that Plato was Moses speaking Greek? Absolutely. We see this taking a detour in the Alexandrian Jewish milieu of Philo, but then it really gets weaponized in somebody like Tatian, right? I wanted to know what the repercussions of these Platonic developments are for the later Christian exegesis 
especially in somebody like Tatian, who's really weaponizing this and saying that our wisdom is the penultimate wisdom and everybody else is just borrowing or like a corruption. So I didn't know if you could talk about that a little bit. So as soon as you have the kind of view that, that we were just talking about, where, where you're looking to reconstruct it, the ancient wisdom through these traditions. Of course, what you want to do is to find the traditions that have been least messed about with in the meantime. So you want to find the, the most conservative traditions and the oldest traditions. And, and that's where the, talking about weaponization, but that's where the polemical edge to this comes to. Because if, if you can say to someone that your tradition is kind of older than theirs or more conservative than theirs, then you have a way of saying that you're kind of culturally better than they are. And, and this becomes a bit of a debate, or already before maybe Platonists, you even start to see this a little bit. And, and it really reverses the kind of ways in which cultures talk to each other, actually. I mean, the, there was a point in time where uh, the Greeks would say, you know, we're better than the Egyptians because we've taken on their, their sort of early insights into mathematics and so on. We've developed it into this great innovative culture, and the Egyptians are too conservative. They're behind the times. But then suddenly you get this kind of switch around the period we're talking about, where people say, hold on, <laughs> the Egyptians are older and more conservative, which means they have a better you know, phone line through to, to the voices of the ancients. So that's a better thing to be. And, and in particular, there's a debate that, that arises between Jewish and, and Egyptian traditions, actually, about whether one is derivative of the other. So some people argue that, that Judaism is, a, is some kind of offshoot of Egyptian uh, religion. Other people argue that it's the other way around, that Egypt is a sort of, Egyptian religion is a kind of offshoot of a corruption of, of Jewish religions. And of course, the figures of, of, of Moses and Joseph too are very important in that debate. So it's really interesting, and it becomes very heated. And that gets carried through to the, the debates that Christians and Platonists have. We talked about Celsus, for example, a Platonist who attacks Christianity on the basis that it's a religion that's an offshoot, a corruption, of another religion, namely Judaism, which itself is, in his eyes, an offshoot of corruption of, he thinks, Egyptian religion too. So it's a doubly corrupt uh, and, and utterly worthless. And, and why, so, you know, why would you beat the Christian? It's actually a, a fairly sort of central part of his argument, and indeed a central part of the response that we get from Origen in, in the third century to it, that, in fact, Kelsus is wrong about this, that, that Christianity is the is the pure reception of Judaism, which itself is is a, is the most ancient and least messed about with tradition that there is. So that's the kind of argument that you get. It, it also, I mean, it has a particular inflection in Christianity, which is quite interesting as well. And in fact, I, I sort of play this the other way around and think this is a bit of an argument for my uh, view of Platonism in a way, which is that um, there's a whole discourse within Christianity that grows up from from the second century about heresy as a as a concept heresy versus orthodoxy. And I think that you can see in, in the people who talk about heresy that they're using exactly the same language that we've been using to talk about the argument from disagreement and the response to it within Platonism. Namely, you only get heresies where you get people going in sort of opposite directions away from some original truth, and they never agree with each other again. So heresies starts with the, the notion of, I mean, it really at root means faction. Um, but you get factions that split off from from some kind of original truth makes the question, but okay, they think it's the truth. But then they never agree with each other again. So that, that's how we know that heresies are, are problematic and, and probably wrong, um, that they just create disagreement. So I think that's a very important part of the Christian reception of the Platonist playbook on this. So it works at a kind of macro level and a micro level. So in, in within the Christian tradition, heresies can be branded as, as can be sort of proved to be wrong by their innovative nature, their lateness, their, their failure to establish agreement, but on the contrary, to create disagreement. Um, so that's on the micro level. But then on the macro level, they can start to say, well, in fact, because Christianity and the Hebrew Christian tradition is the most ancient, the most pure tradition. All these other ones we can think of as being themselves kind of quasi-heretical divisions off from it. So Egyptian religion is is a sort of is kind of a heresy in, 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 a, in a big historical perspective. It's a division off from Judaism, which has created these disagreements, and so is Greek culture. And so the, you get these culture wars based on this big argument now about, about the genealogy of, of these mythological traditions. And Christian her heresiological writing is very interesting for that reason, because it, it does 
spend a weird amount of time, if you don't see this picture, I think, it spends a weird amount of time aligning the heresies with mistakes that, that pagan nations have made. It's a few observations. It's very interesting that you were talking about how Celsus is viewing Christianity as an offshoot of an abomination, of an offshoot of another older tradition. And I think the strange ingenuity of Christianity was to ultimately take that, and it culminates in somebody like Constantine, who effectively invents the concept of Christian progress by saying that this Hebraic Christian tradition is the original way man was before the corruption. Because Constantine was living in a time where Rome has this kind of idea of decline and fall and restoration and renewal, but there's no concept of restoration and renewal like with a Christian God. So Constantine has to kind of do what the theologians and the Christian philosophers are doing and say, no, this is the natural state of how people were before, and I'm just restoring it. And this is what people like Tatian are doing maybe in a more polemical sense where they're calling the Greek deities demons for lack of a better term. This is a very good example. So you're, you're, what you're seeing there is a, an explanation of how you get the Greek tradition. It's not like, and it's a corruption of the, the Hebrew. So there are angels. It's quite true, right? Um, but what the Greeks forgot is that there are, there's a God above them. So they start worshiping the angels, we call them demons now, but we, we worship those in ignorance. And so you've got a whole explanation for how this corruption happened as well as just an assertion, which is really interesting. Just the concept of the heresiological writings and the heresiologists themselves, what they're doing with tracing these heresies back to founders and uh, quote unquote teachers is not unlike what Diogenes Laertius is doing with the philosophical schools, right? right. Heresis, um, yeah. I think you can translate heresis as school. Yeah. They're finding the original founder of this school and they're creating a succession, just like they're creating their own counter succession of apostolic authority. Now, what they're doing is not any different than what the Platonists and other philosophical schools have been doing in terms of tracing that succession. It's quite interesting if we kind of get into this in terms of looking at these heresies as Gnostic or not. If you ask any scholar who specializes in these Gnostic and heresiological schools, nobody's always going to agree with labeling these groups Gnostic, because even if you put a term Gnostic on top of these groups, it obscures the fact that not everybody, even in these other so-called divergent groups, they're not necessarily always agreeing with each other. So like, even there, you have disagreement in these groups. Well, George, thank you so much. It's been a great discussion. Thank you for having me again. You have a wonderful evening. Uh, you too. Thanks very much, Jason. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.